to start spectroscopy. Some places actually wait and put spectroscopy at the very, all, all the way off into organic chemistry too. I had moved it up for a couple of reasons, but one of which because this way, once we start looking at the functional groups, we can also then go hand in hand with talking about the spectroscopic nature behind it, okay? Rather than you have to learn functional groups, then you have to learn spectroscopy, then you have to go back and forth, and it's just things that just make sense that while you're learning methods, you learn this method. Spectroscopy sounds like a, I don't know, a $10 you know, vocabulary word, but all it means simply is that it's where you're using light, okay, in order to study something. It's just that you have to think way back to gen chem and maybe even physics. I'm not, not for sure what, um, what parts of light and wave particle nature of light and all that kind of stuff that you cover in physics. But I know in gen chem we covered this. And there's that whole electromagnetic spectrum. Okay? And there are different parts of that spectrum that correlates to different types of spectroscopy, which is very important. Okay? So, so... <laughs> The important thing here, once again, spectroscopy, all spectroscopy is, really, is just using light to study the compound. The three that we're going to talk about, and actually we're going to spend the most, most time on these top two, a little bit of time on UV vis. I don't know that we're going to have enough time to cover mass spectrometry in the lecture. All right, so uh, it's one that we, we don't have a mass, spectrometer, mass spectrometer here. Um, it is interesting. It's, it's, it's the one that just doesn't fit with all the rust. And since it's used mainly, when they look at it, especially when looking at molecular mass, and some structure to a certain extent, but not like the other three. The other three give you much more direct, um, direct um, structural information. And these are not the only ones. There's like, for example, there's another one that's called EPR for electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy, which just uses a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so this is electromagnetic spectrum. And our eyes only perceive this very, 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 very small portion of the spectrum. Okay, it's the visible spectrum. Now I've heard that you know v, that bees can look into the IR spectrum. Because first of all, I wouldn't know how they administer a vision test to a bee. I don't know, like, but and it's still cool. Like, can you imagine? Like, what would that be in the IR? Like, what do they see different colors? Or you could be like me, be color perception challenged. So I only see a handful of those, those colors that they have up there. So, but there's there are lots of different possibilities. But no, our, the human eye can only has, has a very limited portion of electromagnetic, and this isn't even drawn to scale, I believe, um, of that, that portion. Infrared waves are used for the IR spectroscopy. And we're going to find out radio frequency, that's used for NMR, which I always wanted to point out the fact that it scares people because it says nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, little historical tidbit. How many people, what does anyone, does, does anyone know what, what's an MRI? Like what do they use MRI for? Magnetic resonance, imaging, right? That's just a big NMR spectroscoper. They, back in the 50s or 60s when they first started, it freaked people out when they said nuclear, okay? Like they just think of like nuclear bomb going off and so they just dropped that. But it's, it's just, essentially it's an NMR that you stick your body into. But no, it's, it's used as radio frequencies are used for NMR. Um, and the UV, UV vis obviously is used for UV vis and so on and so forth. Okay, so just to review from Gen Chem, they take, whoops, so we, we have light, and light, like the smallest particle, the smallest little packet of light that you could have is called a photon. Okay, and I would write this one a little differently. We would have the energy of a single photon is equal to H, which is Planck's constant, times nu. That's not V, that's nu, which is a 
the Greek letter, which is the frequency with which it's the, the way it's traveling, you know. <clears throat> and then it's limited in the universe by the speed of light, okay? The speed of light in a vacuum, technically speaking. And so the speed of light in a vacuum is 3 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. Nu versus lambda. Lambda is the wavelength. And it should make sense that wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. Things that have like radio frequencies, which have really, really, really huge wavelengths, some of them can go you know meters upon meters upon meters, have very small frequencies. Whereas you have something like a gamma ray, which has a very, very tiny wavelength that has a very high frequency because it pulsates per length uh, many more times than a big old wavelength. Okay. <clears throat> And so there's a huge range of spans. I've already alluded to this. In fact, that we have radio frequencies that literally go meters and meters and meters. So 10 to the 12 nanometers is at that as a kilometer, okay? And then gamma rays would be the highest in energy. They have the highest frequency, okay? Whereas radio waves would have the lowest. All right, so this is where hopefully we haven't freaked anyone out yet, okay? You probably remember, maybe it was in junior high or high school or something, you probably remember something like, that looked like this. You don't have to draw this because it is drastically an oversimplification of anything. But if you remember, you'd have like your, the kind of, there'd be, and this is not drawn to scale, there's the nucleus, and you have these different energy levels for the electrons. Oops. Those are supposed to be concentric, but they aren't, obviously. And you could actually give just the right amount of energy, and you could cause this little electron here to go from one energy level to the next energy level, because they were discrete energy levels, right? You couldn't just be anywhere and you had to be at these discrete energy levels okay. and so or you could even get if you had enough you could cause that electron to go all the way up to two energy levels so now perhaps we have it go all the way up here but that's the discrete amount of energy they called it a quanta okay so those packets of energy <clears throat> and then you can imagine the electron comes back down and when it comes back down it gives off that amount of energy that delta e So that leads to this idea of quantum mechanics, okay? And it's just a fancy term where energy is quantized or they're, you know, uh, a quantum, but multiple, it's not called quantums, it's called quanta, but that there are, you know, these discrete energy levels and there's discrete uh, wavelengths that what happens is if you get just the right wavelength or just amount right amount of energy you can cause the electron to pop up to one energy level you can also have it come back down and so on and, and if so then that amount of energy is given off <clears throat> okay and so what happens here is if you graph so when light is just the right frequency so there's our frequency it depends on the molecule, the light is absorbed and it can jump up, okay? Just like whenever it comes back down, whenever it relaxes, it's going to give off that same amount of energy, that same frequency, okay? And if you, spot, if you plotted a graph of that, you would see the spectrum, okay? So hopefully there's nothing new. Once, you know, you shine the light at the exact right frequency, you can cause the electron to go up. If it comes down, it's going to give off that same amount of energy. Okay. So now, <coughs> this is where it gets a little more tricky. <clears throat> you can imagine, you know, just like, you know, oh, whoops, that's not the right one. Just like the world, you know, the world spins around on its axis. 
Okay? You can imagine the nucleus itself being, you know, this little sphere. So we have this nucleus. It has a charge, right? There, there are protons and neutrons in there. Neutrons are neutral. Well, as it spins, if you think back to uh, physics, it's going to give off a magnetic field that's in the opposite of its spin. Okay? <clears throat> right, so it has a magnetic moment that's going on and on and on. Perhaps here, let me just show the picture. Their picture is a lot better than my picture ever would be. All right, so just like an electron has a little spin, so electrons, you can imagine them being like little spheres, and they spin around, and they spin around. The nucleus itself spins around, okay? That shouldn't be, you know, you can just think of it, and the way I look, would always picture it is it's just like the Earth on a, you know, the globe, and it can spin around, spin around, and spin around, but it's going to have an axis and so on and so forth. <clears throat> okay? So because of that, the nucleus can have this associated spanner and this magnetic moment. Now, what happens is usually, if you just had a, a bucket or a beaker of nuclei around, some of them would have their magnetic moment going one direction, maybe going another direction, but they would all average out. There would not be an overall magnetic moment because they're just random, okay? So statistics would indicate that these are vectors and so they would actually just cancel all out so there's no overall magnetic moment to that beaker of, of you know, nuclei, that beaker of electrons, okay? So it's just random. Now what you can do is if you take a big magnet and you put this magnet, external magnet, that looks more like a really ramshackled house, but it was an external magnet, it's going to cause those nuclei to line up. Okay, does it make sense? You stick them on there. You've probably seen like with iron filings or whatever, stick it, and then everything will start to line up and get in there. So it's no longer random. Well, whenever that happens, I want to point something out. This is the external magnet. I think sometimes in physics they use the letter H, H naught. In organic chemistry they use B. I don't, I don't know. I don't know why, but this is the magnetic, let's see the magnetic field, it's going to have its magnetic moment. The majority of nuclei will actually have their magnetic moments line up, okay? Sort of like the current, I hate to use the word current, but you know, like if this was a river, they would all be lined up to where their little currents, their little rivers would all be going the same direction. Those little fish would all be going, you know, swimming the same direction. There are going to be a few, though, that's going up against the magnetic moment. So, do you suppose which one of these two groups, those that are going with or those that are going against, which one's going to require more energy? We higher in energy than the other. The, the, yeah, the one's going against, right? They have to go against that. Once again, I'm just talking about current, but I just like to think of it with respect to, like, if you are, you know, whenever, whenever my wife and I go kayaking, it's easy to go along with that current overall, but if you're going up against it, it takes a lot more energy in order to do that. Okay, so I wanted to explain that before I showed you this picture. <clears throat> because I noticed whenever I would first start to learn this, I'm like, what are they talking? I mean, this makes no sense to me. So what happens here is we've got the random nuclear spin states. That'd be like that beaker. There's no external magnet whatsoever. And so we don't, there's no overall energy difference. What happens though is whenever you put in a magnet, it's gonna cause, most of them are gonna go along with the, the, the magnetic moment of the external magnet. So they're gonna be lower in energy, but there's gonna be a, a few that's gonna be higher in energy you can actually measure this energy difference, okay? It's called delta E. If you add a magnet that's even higher, an even stronger one, that energy difference is gonna be even larger, okay? even easier to tell. So that change in the energy, that difference between those energetic states, 
is directly related, directly proportional to how strong your external magnet is. So you may have heard of some of the NMR machines. And they'll say, oh, that's a 200 you know, megahertz or versus a 400 or 600 or 800. Obviously, the, the more strong the magnet, the better that, the bigger that separation will be. And you want as big a separation as possible if you can in order to be able to differentiate those that are going with it versus those that are going against it. Okay. Once again, I also want to point out one thing, and that's the part of the spectrum. I have been known to ask this on quizzes and exams. Like what part of the spectrum? Because it really freaks people out when you hear them talking about NMR or MRI machines, and they say they. I've heard people like refer and they think of it as like an X-ray or a gamma ray or whatever. It's not. It's a radio frequency. Like it's you're getting the same amount of energy essentially by listening to your car radio in that sense because it's using radio frequencies. All right, it's not the same as an X-ray machine, which is going to have much higher energy than the NMR. All right. So there's at least three parts to a spectro. They're called spectrometers. Sometimes they're called spectrophotometers. It's the same. I use it interchangeably. Most places do. There are at least three components. You have to have that external magnet that generates the magnetic field. You have to have some type of radio frequency transmitter, which puts the radio waves in. And I'll explain what that radio waves do in just a moment. And then you have to have a de detector for whatever comes off, okay? Usually, we're talking about what they call pulses that have a wide range of frequencies, okay? So what happens, and there are different types. Remember, we're talking only about the nucleus. We're not talking about the electrons. We're only talking about the nucleus and the effect of the nuclei. And there are certain elements, and specifically, there are certain isotopes of elements that are that are visible in the NMR. The one that we're going to talk about the most, and that's the most important for us, is called the proton NMR. Remember, there are three isotopes for hydrogen. There's the proton, the proteon, which is the vast majority, like 99% or close to it. Then there's the deuteron, which sometimes they give the letter D, and there's tritium, the tritium, okay? Proton is the most abundant, and it's also something you can pick up in an NMR. For carbon C13, which we'll talk a little bit about C13 towards the end of this chapter. I don't know that we'll, we'll definitely won't get to it today. I don't know what day we will. But you can also do N15, O, is it O18? Oh, Lord. I forgot which oxygen. It can't be that one. F19, I think is one. But the ones that are the most important here, what is it? What is it? This is my mind. Are, these are the three biggies for organic chemistry and biochemistry. And one of the reasons why is the oxygen one, well, first of all, fluorine's not that important. I shouldn't say that. Fluorine's not that important biologically speaking because we don't have that much fluorine in our body. Oxygen, the reason why it's not more important is the fact that the isotope that's visible on the NMR is just not very abundant. So you have to do what they call enriching, which is very, very expensive. Okay, so that's why it's just easier to look at. Hydrogen's the easiest because it's the most abundant. C13, it's not the most abundant. No, carbon-12 is the most abundant isotope, but there's enough of it. It's like 1% to 3% of all carbons, if I remember right, um, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but that's enough for you to, to see. And then N15, those are the ones that are the that are most frequently used, and P33, for, especially for nucleic acids, you can use P33. All right. <clears throat> okay, and then I want to point out this fact that all of them, all of the protons in that sample are going to be excited simultaneously, and then they're going to give off energy, is what that radiation is. They give it off as they relax. It's called free induction decay. And so what you do is you shoot it with the right frequency, you excite it, and then you just measure to see what frequencies are given off. All righty. Nuclear shielding and chemical shifts. These are very, very important. And I'm going to draw my spectra, and I would like for you, if you do this on 
like in class, uh, in any type of in-class assignment or on your exams, I always, always include the TMS. TMS, you have to have something. If you think about it with a number line, we have to have something as our reference, like as our control. TMS is the control for both Proton and C13. So its location on that radio dial, if you want to think of it that way, is zero. Now, for whatever reason, and historically I don't know why, but both Proton, if you look at this number line, both the Proton and C13 go right to left instead of left to right. Those are not negative numbers. I don't know why. I'm sure that you know, there are scientific historians. By the way, P33 does it the, the quote-unquote normal way. Like, it goes left to right, like what you would normally think of. But So that's why we see the shift. But what I was going to say is I would always, whenever I dried out for you, I always include a peak there. In reality, the computer would subtract that out. That way you know where zero is whenever I draw it. I draw a little peak. And we'll explain what this all means as we go along. Okay. So, now once again, we have to think we are looking at protons. We only see, so if this is just a, a bond between a carbon and a, the carbon has a hydrogen on it. When we're talking about the NMR, the proton NMR, we're only looking at the proton. We are not looking at that carbon. It doesn't tell you the carbon directly. It's only going to tell you about that proton. And remember, we're talking about that proton and not the electrons in that environment directly either. Remember, it's only the proton. And whether or not that proton flips with or against the external magnet. Okay? Now, that being said, there are electrons. And electrons themselves also they also affect the magnetic fields, right? They're gonna be negatively charged, they're a little spinning around. And so because of that, the electrons, they go the opposite direction. So if we have this external magnet and it's set for the frequency to look at this, it's gonna cause the electrons around it to go in the opposite, okay? But what happens here is that if you've got a lot of electrons, so you've got so much, not, let's see, if you've got lots and lots of electron density here, the effect of this external magnet is not going to be as great. Does that make sense? Because the electrons are kind of blocking it. There's so much electron density and then there's shielding going up against the, the opposite that that proton, this proton right here, which I realized I'm recording it, that you can't see the arm actions if you listen to this later on, this proton right here doesn't feel this external magnet as much because there's so much electron density around it. So that's called shielding. Now, if there's very little electron density directly around this right here, it's called being deshielded. And so what happens here is protons are in different environments they have different degrees of shielding. So, I wanted to, to, to point that out before I show you this next one. So once again, we're looking at, we've, we've got our radio, our radio dial, for lack of a better word, this external magnet set to see this. However, if there's lots and lots of electron density here to kind of go up against it, this proton doesn't feel as much as that external magnet, so it's called shielded. Whereas if there's very little electron density around it, it's gonna feel that the brunt force of that external magnet a lot more, and so it's gonna become de-shielded. Okay, I wanted to point that out before I show you this and start to freak people out. So we've talked about shielding, and then the next term that gets used a lot is called chemical shift. Okay. <clears throat> so once again, this is just the little figure that we've been talking about so far. There's no difference. That's your beaker full of protons or whatever, something that has hydrogens on it. You add an external magnet. Most of them are going to go along with the external magnet. There's going to be some that's going to be against it. You, if, if you go to high enough, you can even see a bigger difference, okay? Then what happens, though, is if we take this into account and we take into account the fact that there are 
are electrons and other things around it that can affect that, you're going to see slight perturbations from where you'd expect it to be. That's called chemical shift, and they use this symbol right here. This is a lowercase delta, okay. which literally means difference. It goes all the way back. If you think back to calculus, remember the little d, the little deltas? The, the big triangle is just a capital delta for change. All right. So as I mentioned before, TMS is that zero. That's our number line. They just say that TMS which is tetramethylsilane, it's very, very shielded, okay? And so they say that is zero. Anything else, you take the position of the signal, so you set your radio dial, so to speak, on what the TMS signal is, zero. Anything else that varies from that is called a chemical shift. So they literally measure the... Let's see, nowadays it becomes more difficult to explain this, but how many of you have driven or ridden in like a, one of the old-fashioned cars, like, you know, a, like a whatever, your car choices, your old car, that the whole AM, FM, especially the AM dial, you know, the kind that had the big push buttons to where it would like move the little thing all over the place. So that's what, sort of like what this is. You can hit that big push button and you may be able to pick something other than, you know, the whatever like the really odd station that's out there you know whereas if you just tweak it just a little bit all of something something else comes in much more clear that's what essentially that's what an mr nmr does is you have that big push so we've added that magnet but then and that's measuring the zero point then if we just tweak it just a little bit you can pick up the new signal that difference is called the chemical shift okay and it is something that's mathematically figured. The position of that signal minus wherever the TMS signal is, you divide it by frequency. These are ridiculously tiny, tiny, tiny differences that we're talking about. And so they multiply it by 10 to the power 6. That's why the units, there are units to this. The units are called parts per million, PPMs. Okay? So if you have something, here, I'm going to go ahead and do this. All right, so let's say, and first of all, this is the carbon trimethyls, what was it, TMS, trimethylsilane, uh, trimethylsilane, which this is what it looks like. Oh, whoops, I did it in the wrong direction, I'm sorry. It's SI, CH3, 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 CH3. What it is are the protons here, and they also use the same one for the carbon, for C13. These protons are so, so shielded. They have so much electron density around them that they, that's why they call it the zero frequency. There, there's no change from itself. Okay, so that's the TMS. <clears throat> so whenever you draw this, First of all, you want to make sure you label it. This is a proton in the MAR. You get a baseline. And that's why I always put in a little thing right here. That's the TMS signal. Like I said, if you're doing this with a computerized one now, they, they deliberately subtract that out. So a lot of times, they, like your book, probably won't even show you. They may say where TMS is, but they may not even show you. They may, they may just show you that that's zero. And that's how they get to zero. Okay, but back in the old days, you would put in your TMS standard first. You'd see where that is. This is in, these are the units. These are deltas and PPM. What's going to happen is, essentially everything else is going to have a shift to it. So if we did something like CH4, and it's not, I don't want you to sit there and memorize numbers. Please, please, don't. there are tables that will help you do that. But I want you to understand the logic. If we had something like CH4, remember, we're only talking about these protons. Well, it no longer has silicon. Okay, because silicon is even less electronegative than carbon, and carbon 
is about the same as protons. So that's why there's so much electron density through here that that's why that they are so shielded. These protons only have one carbon to help it out. So what's going to happen is it's going to feel the effect of the magnet more. So it's going to be shifted down this direction. So this direction in general, whoops, that's supposed to be an arrow. It really looks crappy. That going that direction and the units for, I mean, typically we're talking about zero to 10. There are certain things that may be zero to 20. I know, I'm sorry, zero to 12 or so, but usually right around zero to 10 is about as far D shield as you get. That's called going downfield. So, as you know, I like football. Just think about it, that's going down the field. Anything going this other direction is called going upfield. So usually then we're, we're comparing a couple different things. <clears throat> All right. So the chemical shift. This is what this is showing. <clears throat> this is just a prettier picture than what I drew. But once again, if I was drawing this for you guys, I would put just a little peak right there so that way you know where zero is. You can see here's 10. There's the delta, some PPMs. This is what the NMR would look like. This only has one proton on it because, remember, we don't see the carbon or the chlorines. Those are silent at that frequency. You can, if you change that frequency to a completely different frequency, you could pick up the carbon on the C13 frequency. But so back to the old AM dial, you'd have to push a, push a different big black button in order to get it jumped far enough over. Okay. But what happens is because of this, these are so electron, electron negative, especially the chlorines, that they're going to be pulling more of the electron density. Here, let me draw it out. There is the hydrogen that we're talking about, Cl, Cl. Of course, this is tetrahedral, but I just drew it this way for brevity. So these are so electronegative that they're pulling more of the electron density away. So this hydrogen right here, it's really feeling that external magnet. When it really feels the external magnet, it's going to go way down field. So this one is at 7.28 ppms. Once again, do not memorize 7.228. Whereas if I if we wanted to look at this one, okay. Now there are two hydrogens, okay, but there's only two chlorines and one carbon. So, and I wouldn't expect you to know the exact number, but it's going to be the peak for it would be shifted upfield because there's one less chlorine. <clears throat> That's the kind of thing that I would expect you to be able to, to rationale, the rationale behind it. All right. So then let's also start thinking about what happens. Once again, please, I don't want you to memorize the number. I want you to understand the logic. So let's draw. You're going to be drawing these a lot. Hopefully you draw a much better job than I do. I don't take off for artistry as long as I can understand and read it. Proton, NMR. Of course we have our TMS. That's at zero, this is 10. Let's just be a delta sign, even though it looks like an eight. I'm too bad. So if my stomach starts to growl, or if I start to sound wheezy because I've been having an asthma attack today, just ignore it. Yeah, if I pass out, yes. Or you can just go and get Dr. Stella. She's just literally right down the hall there. But no, my my tomato soup has worn off quite some time ago. All right. So we compared TMS, which once again, I, I argue, you can look at your notes and see what it really looks like. Now we have to think about, if we look at the following, let's say that we just look at CH3F, 
Once again, there's only one type of proton. There are three of them, but they're all in the same chemical environment. They're all attached to one, the one carbon that has a fluorine on it. And in this color, we look at these. Now there are six protons, but they are all in, and I can't speak either. They are all in an identical environment, <laughs> right? Because they are all attached to a carbon that is attached to an oxygen. <laughs> And we'll throw in a third one, just for fun, because it is so much fun. We haven't even got to how this works with structure. Some people, if you like jigsaw puzzles and mysteries, then some people actually enjoy the NMR stuff, because it's all logic-based. I don't require you to memorize any formulas on how to figure all out the, the math behind it. But you're given spectra and you have to work backwards to try to figure out what that structure looks like. Or you're given the structure and you have to figure out what the NMR spectra. It's just unfortunately you don't have all the time in the world when you're on a, an exam or quiz. But otherwise it is. They're not, they're not that bad. It's some, some trial and error and just putting the pieces together just like a jigsaw. All right. So I just want to point out all of these, these nine hydrogens here are identical to each other. They are all attached to a carbon that's attached to the nitrogen. So this is an amine. This one, what functional, to review, what functional group is this one? It's carbon, oxygen, carbon. Say it with some conviction here. Someone said it. Ether, right? R, O, R. And then this one is just fluoromethane. You'd expect I'd expect you to have named that one. Of these three, the one with the fluorine, the one with the oxygen, and the one with the nitrogen, which do you suppose the hydrogen is going to be so deshielded that it's going to feel the magnet the most? It's going to be either this one or this one. No, odds are. Okay, those are the two extremes. Um, is the fluorine going to remove the electron density more to make the hydrogen feel the external magnet? Or will the nitrogen remove the electron density more so that way the proton feels the external magnet. The fluorine, right? It's more electronegative. And so when we, do, if I draw this all the way out, we have a carbon, hydrogen, 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 and fluorine. What happens here is this fluorine is so electronegative that it pulls more of the electron density this direction. So the nucleus, remember we're looking at the nucleus, and the nucleus is what moves along the little number line, not the electrons. But the nucleus feels that magnet a lot more. So it's going to be further down here. The actual number, by the way, is 4.3. That's why I color-coded this. So, see, H3 is 4.3. I don't expect you to memorize that number. I just would expect you to be able to talk about them with respect to each other. So which one, the ox, whoops, that's supposed to be the highlighter. The, I mean, the, 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 the oxygen or the nitrogen, which one do you suppose is going to be the worst? I shouldn't say the worst. The one that be, is de-shielded, uh, no, 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 that's not right. Is shielding the most to where it's going to be closest to zero. Which one's going to be closest to zero, the oxygen or the nitrogen? The, the hydrogens that are by the nitrogen, okay, which the actual number... It's 2.2, so it's down somewhere around here, and then oxygen somewhere in the middle, okay? And the whole purpose of that, well, not purpose, but the whole reason I wanted to point this out is because the more electronegative the environment, almost always, means that these protons are gonna feel the effects of the magnet. They don't have their electron density around them as much, so they're gonna feel that pull. So the, the delta E, is going to be bigger for them than it would be for the nitrogen. And, I mean, we can go to ethane. Ethane, which is, if we wanted to look at the same, something similar. These are six hydrogens, but they're all in the identical environment. It's really close. It's, it's by the way, 0 0.9. But it's really, it should make sense. It's the one that's closest. Okay. <clears throat>
Okay, so that's why this is just showing you that we worked out together. Hey, so the more electronegative the environment, the more de-shielded it is. So the stronger the effects and the further up, uh, I'm, for, I'm sorry, the further downfield it will be. Okay, the less electronegative environment, so things like with being around a carbon or being around this silicon, um, the more shielded it is, so the closer to zero it will be, the closer upfield, okay? And it should make sense that it's also cumulative. So the hydrogen that has three chlorines around it, which I already talked about this, is going to be the furthest down the field. If there are just two chlorines around it, it's going to be second. If there's one, it'll be third. Of course, if there are none, it would be somewhere really close to zero. <clears throat> Please do not memorize the numbers here, but I want you to understand the logic. We've actually already done a lot of this. This you can find in your book, this kind of thing, or these tables, but it should make sense when we start to compare environments. Carboxylic acids, so let's look at it. They tend to be the furthest downfield, which should make sense. Remember, if we draw this out, remember we're only looking at that proton. So there is so much electron negativity here and there's resonance between the two. So there's a zap and more of the electron density wave. That proton doesn't have a chance against that magnet. It's gonna really feel that magnet. So it's gonna be the furthest down field. You know, aldehydes are gonna be pretty far down field too. <clears throat> Phenols, which you didn't have to remember, but the phenol, what that looks like is this. And we'll talk about some exceptions. So hopefully you can see where the phenol proton here, this is electronegative, plus we have resonance here, so it's helping pull it down. So that's one of the reasons why it tends to be pretty far down the field. There are, like I said, there are other ways that start to perturb it. If it's um, on a double bond, it just makes sense. There's a lot of electron density here that's being pulled down. So it's going to feel it more than a single bond. Now, one exception to that is if you look, and we'll talk about the reasons why, but the terminal alkyne ones are actually not, they're actually further upfield than the, than the double bond ones. And we'll talk about the reasons why for that one, probably, I don't think it's going to be, I think it's probably going to be tomorrow. Uh, not tomorrow, I'm sorry, but with the next class. Okay, but I want you to be trying to get an idea. Whereas if we look, we haven't used this term vanillic versus allylic, but these are, see there's a double bond here, then a single bond and that hydrogen off of it. Notice it's further upfield than if that hydrogen is directly attached to the double bond, which makes sense. Double, double, if it's directly attached to the double bond, there's more electron density pulling it down pulling the electron density towards it, I should say. If it's one removed, it doesn't feel the effect nearly as much. Okay. All right. Here we go. So orbital hybridization, which is just a fancy way of saying double bonds, okay, <laughs> versus single bonds and so on and so forth, it, they do cause deshielding. And the closer it is to those, the more deshielded it becomes. With the exception, once again, that when we talk about the triple bond. <clears throat> Another one that some people don't, whoops, may not realize is whether it's what type of alkyl group it is also affects it. So this one right here, I'm going to draw it on a different on a different one. See this. Hydrogen versus this one, there's not a huge difference, but there is a slight difference, and one that if you have a good NMR, you can pick up on. So if I'm going to draw, or I not if, I am going to draw it. What I mean by that is this. 
let me switch to dark color once again. Don't memorize the numbers, and this is definitely not drawn to scale. Notice all the parts that I put on here. You have to make sure you learn to label everything. So this general, sorry, this general area down here, that's going to be things like CH4, obviously, and methyl groups. Because they're going to be closest to zero. If it's a car, if, if it looks like this, it's going to be further downfield. If it looks like this, it's going to be even further downfield. Once again, that's not drawn to scale. We're talking about the difference being 0.9 and, you know, 2. Okay, but just to realize that if we have a hydrogen that's on a tertiary carbon, then it's going to be further downfield if it's a hydrogen that's on a secondary carbon, hydrogen on a primary carbon, or methane. Okay, and so they're all going to be shifting a little further and further and further downfield, depending upon how many carbons are around. The more carbons that are around, the more de-shielded it becomes. Okay. Are you saying that the methane and the primary are basically overlapping each other? I mean, they're going to be really, really close. Mm -hmm. methane, methane will be closer to zero than the methyl. Okay. Assuming that this is, isn't a CL. Like if you had an F or a CL or BR, then it's going to be even further downfield than what you'd expect. Okay. Versus if that's a carbon. Because any time that you start, that's why we can fine-tune our radio dial, our NMR dial, to pick up these really slight changes, and you can start to differentiate what type of proton is what. And when, what we'll start to pick up on, on Wednesday's class as we'll start putting this together to start to figure out how to put the pieces in. Um, which, once again, it's really cool. It's just a shame sometimes that you can't just sit there and, you know, beat your head against the desk or whatever a few, few times and trying to figure out how the... It's literally a jigsaw puzzle that you're putting. Okay, this piece can't fit here, but it's got to fit there, and it can't be where you just take the scissors and chop a little piece of it off and cheat. Not that I would do that. <laughs>